Hi, welcome back to another episode of Interesting and Sexy, a podcast dedicated to spreading the awareness and visibility of intersex people, as well as sharing and discussing issues about queer life, being different, and all things interesting and sexy. Today is the first ever interview, and I'm really, really excited about it. We have an amazing guest, um, and I am just so ready to start interviewing people and um, yeah, it's, it's a really awesome episode and, um, I hope you all learn a lot and yeah, our guest is just amazing. So, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and introduce them now. So here they are. All right. So, hey Mimi, how are you? Good. I'm going really, really well. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Yes. Very excited to have you on. It feels really good that you're the first guest and yeah, I'm really excited to get into it. Super, super exciting. A bit nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I'm a little bit nervous about being my, being a host from an interview podcast, but you know, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Well, I heard you on um, QZ the other day. Oh, yeah. And it was so good. So if you're as good as you are in front of the, like, in the host seat as you are in the interviewer, you'll be amazing. Oh, (laughs) okay. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, uh, So I guess before we go into everything, I would like you to tell us all a little bit about yourself. Who is... Mimi, what is Mimi about and how do you identify? Amazing. So my name's Mimi. My pronouns are she and they. Um, I'm a 27, 26-year-old. I always get confused with my age, but 26-year-old girl um, living in Canberra. Um, I work as the Intersex Project Coordinator for an organization called Agenda Agenda. So it's a small kind of little org in the ACT working on trans, gender diverse and intersex issues. So we do a lot of peer support work, a lot of advocacy, um, just a lot of really, really cool things. Um, so that's kind of my my passion. But at the moment, I'm also studying and doing a master's of nursing. Um, so we'll see where where that goes. Yay. That'll be amazing having a nurse finally that knows what intersex is, knows all about it. I know. It's very exciting. I've been doing some of the the lecture content and when they cover intersex issues, I'm like, maybe I should butt in right now. <laughs> and and <laughs> some of the topics aren't taught in the best way possible. I think all in all. Um, it's really nice. And nursing itself is very exciting. There's so many different avenues to pursue. Um, But yeah, and while in Canberra, I'm currently living, so I've got a a beautiful, beautiful partner, um, Jess, and we have our little baby, Charlie, who's a three-year-old dog. (laughs) And we are both obsessed with her. So when I'm not working or studying, I'm pretty much spent giving 100% of my attention to Charlie because that's what she demands. Mm-hmm. I feel you. And she deserves it as well, probably. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, Jess gets annoyed when I, um, not annoyed, but she she laughs when I think maybe I overcoddle Charlie mm-hmm. or make her extra special meals with some fish oil in it and some yogurt. And yeah, she's very oh, cute. Oh, princess. We love a princess poochie. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's it's amazing how much stuff that you are fitting into your life. It sounds like you're very busy and uh, doing very good work. Um, so the reason why I brought you on today, I think everyone might be aware, but um, you happen to be interesting and sexy. But yes. <laughs> I would like to know um, what kind of intersex variation are you and can you speak a little bit about it and how it works if you feel comfortable with that yeah of course so I've got this variation called 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase deficiency it's such a mouthful um and kind of my party trick that I remembered it and can just you know say it off 
off the roll of my tongue. Um, but it's a variation. It's one of the over 40 different variations of sex characteristics. And it's one of the less common ones um, in terms of intersex variations. Um, there's only a, a, a I, I think I've met maybe three or four other people with my specific variation in the world, but um, mm, it's wow. really, really cool. And it's an intersex variation, which means that I'm deficient in kind of absorbing androgens and testosterones. Um, so to get onto the biology of things, um, which I found really hard because I haven't done biology since year 10. So it uh -huh. was a bit of a curveball when I started nursing. Yeah. Um, but I've come to understand that all fetuses, you know, uh, start off as female in the womb. Mm -hmm. um, the and default baby, how I like to call it. The default babies, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're all got a bit of girl power in us. Um, and we basically start off as female fetuses and I see the chromosome. So XX or XY as kind of like the code for the, how the body will develop. Mm. And if you have XY chromosomes, it means you'll develop typically male sex characteristics. Mm. And if you have XX chromosomes, you'll develop typically female sex characteristics. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are other chromosomes such as like X or XXY or all of these other different intersex variations. Mm -hmm. So the one I have means that um, I was coded with the XY chromosome. So mm -hmm. I was meant to kind of develop um, and become a male in body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this variation, 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase deficiency, means that my body was like, oh, actually, maybe not, you know, maybe I don't want that testosterone, maybe I don't want yeah. all of these antigens. Yes, um, I feel you. And, yeah. So it basically kind of pushed um, or didn't didn't kind of take on these these testosterones that my body had coded for me. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, my body remained typically female sex characteristics, mm -hmm. um, even though I was programmed to be male. And um, yeah. So if you think about like the, the gonads, um, which are your reproductive sex organs, um, if you have XY chromosomes, they'll develop into testes. If you've got XX, they'll develop into ovaries. Mm -hmm. And similarly, um, things like your clitoris, if you have XY um, and the testosterone comes on board, it'll then develop into a penis. Mm -hmm. So all of these sex characteristics I see is like, there's the male version and there's the female version for better of a or lack of a better word mm -hmm. um and it's just how it's kind of um impacted by by testosterone or by hormones so either testosterone or estrogen and for me I just kind of like yeah remained typically female um and grew up as a typically female um person yes Nice. So it, it, it sounds like it works a little similarly to androgen insensitive, insensitivity syndrome. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There are some I, differences. <laughs> yeah. When I was first diagnosed with um, 17 beta HSD3, mm -hmm. um, doctors did first think it could be AIS. Mm -hmm. um but then further tests showed that it was actually a little bit more niche nice <laughs> um so could you take us on your journey of discovery or you can tell your whole life story or what, whatever you want to however you want to go about this I love telling my whole life story yes, um okay. right, go really for it. We're here for a good time there's this one meme and it's um like as soon as you get one drink in me and you're an intersex person just your whole intersex story kind of comes out and definitely when I first found out I was intersex that was a hundred percent me I'd tell like any stranger at the club I'd be like oh my gosh you have to find this out like did you know that intersex people exist um oh my God. so it's a huge passion of mine to like share my story um but basically, as I mentioned, um, I was diagnosed with this variation, um, but that was 
when the doctors found out that I was intersex. Um, and at the time I was about one. Um, so I had just been born and doctors had found two kind of lumps in my abdomen. Mm -hmm. um, and upon further investigation, they found out that they were testes, internal testes. Mm. Um, and they were like, hmm, a little baby girl should not probably be having testes mm -hmm. um, in her body. So they told my parents about this and they also reported risks of cancer um, and such. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, my parents consented to a surgery which removed um, my testes and um, since then I had to get on to other medical interventions so such as hormone replacement therapy um, and that started when I was 12 years old so at 12 years old I was told I was sat down by my doctors and my parents mm -hmm. and I was told Mimi you've got this variation called 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase deficiency and I was like what the fuck is that sorry can I swear sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah go for it swear away <laughs> <laughs> I was like what the hell is that um and the the doctor said unfortunately it has a couple of negative um things it means you can't have kids you won't get your period it also means you'll have to start this hormone replacement therapy um or hrt mm -hmm. and in my mind these were all like really negative things that were attributed to this variation that i had that i didn't quite even understand because i couldn't even read the word that they had given me for for my variation let alone comprehend it um I remember at the time I tried googling it and I swear you needed like a, a biology master's PhD or something mm -hmm. to understand what 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase deficiency meant um so this was something I really tried to isolate I guess um it was really really bad it's something that made me different mm -hmm. um it was also something that I was told by my doctors and by my parents to not talk about um, and to not kind of tell any of my friends or uh -huh. tell any of my siblings. Um, so in my mind, I was like, gosh, there's this thing that I have that makes me different. It's got these bad things attached to it. Like I can't have kids I can't have my period like normal girls um and furthermore I'm told that I can't talk about this this must be something really really bad this must be something that I should feel a lot of shame about um which totally should not have happened but unfortunately that is the experience I went through um and as I said that was when I was about 12 years old Mm -hmm. I then went through a, a bit of a tumultuous teenage years of, of kind of struggling with um, trying to cover and keep secret my differences um, and who I was. Um, and I guess because I was told that I was a girl when when I was kind of given this variation, I was told, don't worry, Mimi, you're a girl. It's just, you can't do these things that normal girls can do. Um, and in my mind, I was like, gosh, I, I've really got to work hard to, to confirm my female identity and to make sure people don't know that I'm not a woman. Um, and so I kind of went through this process of really pushing my femininity and uh, my female identity, um, which can, and I think was slightly damaging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, basically fast forward to when I was about 21 and I was on a bit of this little rabbit hole on YouTube and I stumbled across this video about, um, it's it, basically a video that was being recorded by Emily Quinn, who's this amazing intersex activist. And she talks all about her intersex experiences mm -hmm. on YouTube um, to kind of like vocalize her experiences and normalize the issues. 
and I was watching these and I was like gosh these are all so familiar Mm. I can relate so deeply um and I can see so many parallels in her experiences and mine um in the in the show links there there were a few resources and one was like a a link to a page of all the intersex variations and I was looking at that page and it was only when I saw like 17 beta da, 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 da. I'd forgotten the word by now mm-hmm. um but I knew it started with 17 and it was really really long and complicated mm-hmm. so I was like hey this I think this is the variation I have um mm-hmm. and I call my my parents up and I say hey um am I intersex? And they go, yeah. And I go, ah, oh, um, why haven't you told me? <laughs> and they go, oh no, we've, we've always told you, Mimi, we've always been very open. Um, we, we told you, you had 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase deficiency. And I was like, hold, hold on, hold on. <laughs> that is not the same thing. Um, and really at that time, um, being given the word intersex was just I mean world changing um Mm -hmm. it connected me up to peer support it meant that I could type intersex into google and read more stories like that of Emily Quinn's um and relate and understand similar struggles we experience um and really understand what it is to be intersex it just changed so much I think Another really important thing is that it it taught me and and let me understand my body a lot a lot better and learn the medical history, um, my medical history, some of the interventions I'd gone through, um, and unfortunately, um, the common experiences that lots of intersex people go through, um, the damaging experiences that is, um, it. Also, I think importantly, help me understand the difference between sex and gender. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. through that process, I was like, well, hang on. I can't be a failure of a female because I'm not a female in the first place. I'm intersex. Uh-huh, and uh-huh. it was only at that point I could I could really understand how someone can be a woman or a man, but also intersex, and how sex and gender are just these two completely different um, concepts, Mm -hmm. um, these two different ideas, and you can hold space in both um, on, and and I think that's something our society just doesn't understand, is, is this difference between sex and gender. We just conflate the two and think, well, if you're a woman, you must be female. And if you're a man, you must be male. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a, a very enlightening process. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's crazy how much like most intersex people uh, when they find out about their variation it has such a big impact on on the perception of of gender and versus sex and then sexuality and everything like that um 100 <laughs> percent. I feel like intersex kind of forces you into um deconstructing your worldviews on heteronormativity mm-hmm. so that is the the world where we believe everyone should be endosex which is the opposite of intersex and mm-hmm. uh cisgender which is the opposite of transgender and mm-hmm. heterosexual instead of being intersex transgender homosexual um and breaking down such heteronormative ideals uh which you're forced to as an intersex person because you have to understand that there's variations in sex characteristics that kind of the the foundation of heteronormativity is actually not quite right um (laughs) and and can be wrong um for a lot of people's lived experiences Mm -hmm. and once that kind of shatters it makes you question your your gender your sexuality and I think it's it's almost quite beneficial I'd say for me that I was kind of forced to 
uh, I want to say open my eyes to different ideas of sex, gender and sexuality, um, mm-hmm. because it really let me question who I am, um, who I'm attracted to, um, and kind of part, create a, my own path in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, powerful. Yeah. <laughs> and I obviously you were super open about it, um, like like you said you feel like it's kind of this superpower that you can go around and telling all these people in the clubs. Like I, I'm exactly the same, uh, which is why I'm doing this right now. Um, What really motivated you to become such an advocate? Yeah. So it, it was really, really tough, I guess, right at the start when I was given this piece of information about myself that I was intersex and I knew that it was something my parents and doctors had tried for so long to keep secret. And I understand that those intentions Mm -hmm. were really, really good and honest, that they were worried about how a young intersex girl would grow up in a world where heteronormativity is the norm um, and where like bullying, discrimination and harassment are, are real issues that we face. Um, but I kind of had to make this decision about whether I was going to continue keeping this part of myself a secret, uh, or whether I was going to be open about it and share my story. Mm -hmm. And I guess a couple of things, uh, two things kind of made me take that leap of faith. Um, one was that, I knew if I kept this a secret, it was just perpetuating the shame, the internalized shame that I was feeling. Um, I knew deep down that being intersex and being open about being intersex is something uh, no one should ever feel shame around and should ever feel like they need to keep secret. Um, And I knew just for myself that if I wasn't open with it to other people, it would just be giving it way more much more power than it deserved um so that was the the initial step to to being open Mm -hmm. another step or the other kind of side of that was that I'd never heard about intersex people before I'd never met another intersex person I'd um I'd never you know seen intersex people living happy, healthy, and proud lives. Um, And I just thought to myself, like, you can't be what you can't see. And because I couldn't see any happy, proud intersex people, um, that's a huge issue as to why I wasn't able to be a happy, proud intersex person. Um, So I thought, well, you know what, maybe I need to take that leap. Um, and be a happy, proud intersex person so other people can be. Um, and that's really what led me into opening up and sharing my story. Um, first to a couple of very close confidants. Um, so one of the first people I told was my friend, Charlie. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what, Charlie, great guy, love Charlie. And he's really, really nice. Uh, one of my really good friends. And I thought, you know what? I think I can tell Charlie about this part of my life, um, this part of my identity. And I think Charlie will um, hold that information really well and not kind of, I, I guess what I was really scared about was people changing how they viewed me uh, or thinking that I was weird, basically. Uh, I was really worried that people would confirm um, my negative talk that I had about myself. Um, So I thought Charlie, you know what, Charlie's a safe person to tell. So I pulled him one side. Uh, We were walking back um, at night and I go, Charlie, I've got something to tell you. Um, And he goes, yeah, what is it? And I go, it's it's something pretty big. Um, I've just found it out. I don't know how it's going to change things, um, but I really hope that it won't change how you see me. Um, and I hope, you know, you'll just be there for me and be my friend. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'll just spit it out, Charlie. 
I'm into sex. And he took a second. He was like, hmm, you know what? I think I'm pretty into sex as well. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm into sex. I, I'm not, well, I'm also into sex, but I'm into sex. And he was like, oh my gosh, okay, what is that? And so then yeah. I had to kind of explain the whole difference between sex and gender. Um, I explained my story, how I came to find out I was into sex. And that absolutely blew his mind um, because he didn't even know that sex and gender were were different things. Um, And it was seeing his little brain explode um, that I was like, this is actually pretty cool. Um, I really enjoy kind of educating people about this um, and, and spreading awareness and education. So I ended up telling more and more friends. Um, A really hard experience was telling my siblings, I think. Um, just because I think, yeah, they were quite shocked that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and Mm -hmm. I guess they were quite sad that they couldn't be there for me growing up, um, in, in that very specific way. I mean, they were there for me in, in a whole range of other ways. Um, but to deal with this process I guess they were sad they they didn't know um but everyone was just so supportive and so lovely and um so eager to kind of understand and learn my story um so that's kind of what really threw me into advocacy and do you feel like this has contributed to your healing as an intersex person like all of this stuff that you went through as soon as you started sharing it did did it help a hundred percent when I first found out I was into sex I um I was seeing a, a psychologist at the time and you know psychology rooms they're pretty soundproof um but I remember kind of uh leaning forward and lowering my voice and say saying to her at a whisper that you know I'm into sex um and I felt so much shame around that. But now that I can actually, you know, come onto a podcast and speak about my experience, I've just um, uh, grown so much and I think feel so much more comfortable in my body. Um, I feel so much more comfortable in my um, sexuality and my gender and in, in all aspects of life. And it's really given me so a much richer understanding of who I am in this world, but also connected me to so many other people and so many, so so many individuals in, in the intersex community. And that's been so enriching. Yay. Yeah. It's, it's so special having a support network. What impact have they really had on you personally? Um, since finding all of these networks and then wanting to even get involved in doing it yourself? Yeah. So the first intersex person I I met in real life um, was this person called Cody Smith. Um, Love Cody. They are an absolute gem. And I think it was really um, when I met them for the first time, and I could see that there was another intersex person who, who shared my some of my experiences um, and could really understand the impact of those experiences on such a different level. Um, that was so special. I'm actually reading a book at the moment um, called XOXY, and there's this passage. Do you mind if I read it out? Absolutely, please. A book by a memoir, actually, by Kimberly Zizelman, um, all about her experiences of coming um, to terms or finding out that she's intersex and coming to terms with it. Um, and I always really struggle about like how does it feel meeting or describing how it feels to meet other intersex people. But I thought she she wrote about it so well. So she says. Um, this is when she she first kind of met another person it, it, she actually just talked to another person on the phone and she said and then something almost magical happened Mandy shared with me her story 
and how it was so similar to mine and how her emotional responses had been the same. I was not singular in my struggles. As I listened to her speak, I realized that this was the first time I was knowingly speaking to another intersex person, someone like me. Maybe I had spoken to one and hadn't realized it, but now I was finally talking to someone who knew how I felt for the first time in my entire life. She wasn't a lone unicorn or a yeti off in Canada. And for me, it's like, oh my gosh, that's so true. Like intersex people are all around us and finally meeting another intersex person is just so mind-blowing because we're always told that you're one in a million, you'll never meet anyone like you. Um, and then actually coming together it's it's so empowering when you were reading that I was feeling like I was getting tears in my eyes and goosebumps because she wrote that so well so well the whole book is just I've um I've started it a couple of days ago and I brought a highlighter because I thought I'd need one and I'm currently on page 68 and I think I've probably highlighted something on at least every page (laughs) yeah I'm gonna have to read that book Um, yeah um but I guess just the the power of connecting with other intersex people um and the healing process that that uh brings is what also made me want to help connect intersex people together um a really cool thing in my work at the moment is that that's a huge scope within within my job is running peer support groups and connecting intersex people together um and it's so nice when we we just like get together over dinner or sometimes over zoom and sometimes it'll be talking about like the most mindless things about Mexican wrestling or um, breeding fish or just like these weird <laughs> niches that people have in their lives. Um, nice. But then other times we talk about similar experiences of what it's like to be intersex and things that maybe happen to us or shitty things that it, we experience at the doctor's office and just all of those conversations, whether it's intersex related or not, are just so special and so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's nice to just have someone who who gets it because I think most of us had that that point where we were like, no one's ever going to understand this. Like, no one's ever going to never. No one I know is going to get this. And then you meet people. You're like, oh, you get it. Oh, you get it in a way that no one else. It's so knows. nice. So nice. Yeah. <laughs> um. Do you have any advice uh, for people looking for support? Because I know um, I was, you know, completely unaware that there was a huge intersex uh, uh, community in Australia until recently, really. Um, do you have, yeah, what's your advice on where to go looking and how to go looking and what to go looking for? So um, I guess. Google can be your best friend. It can also be a bit of a dangerous place, um, but it can be really, really good at helping you understand um, more about your body, about your community, about all of these different things. Um, YouTube for me was kind of my, um, the thing that led to my discovery. And there are definitely some great YouTube channels. So Emily Quinn's Intersex Experience. Um, I know Pigeon Pagonis is another intersex activist who um, does videos um, as well as Hello Hearts. Um, so all amazing people um, and just watching videos um, and seeing your story reflected in their experiences is really, really cool. Um, There are also some really good websites. So one that I found really helpful was DSD Teens. Um, I know that term DSD can be somewhat controversial. Um, So if you don't know, DSD usually stands for differences in sex development. Originally, originally it was coined after the term disorders of sex development, but using the word disorder, I think really pathologizes our community and our bodies. Um, And if you think of our bodies as a disorder, then it perpetuates that idea that our bodies need to be fixed, which is something that 
um, definitely shouldn't be perpetuated. Um, so that's why DSD is often used more in the medical community um, and intersex people mostly prefer being called intersex. Um, but yeah, there, I divulge. There is this one per, um, website called DSD Teens and they go through um, different intersex variations um, and what you need to know at different stages and different ages, uh, which is really interesting. And even when I was 21 and I was reading back about the information I should have when I was 12 years old and when I was 14 years old and when I was 16 years old, I think was really, really informative. Um, within Australia specifically, I think there's uh, Intersex Human Rights Australia. And they're a really good website to kind of cover your ground on all intersex human rights issues and understanding more, I guess, academic um, perspectives and understanding of, of your community. Um, there's also a, an organization called Intersex Peer Support Australia. And they are really, really awesome at connecting intersex people up together um, and kind of facilitating more of that peer support. Um, finally, there's also this new program called Interlink. Mm -hmm. And it's been developed by Bonnie Hart, which who is an amazing, amazing intersex advocate. Um, and she's wow. running kind of these uh, six to eight week kind of compact peer support support navigation um, groups and they're specifically for either you know young intersex children or intersex adults or parents of intersex children um, and all of the sessions are done with um, a, a mental health practitioner so it's very very supportive space um, so there's lots lots of support for intersex people across Australia. Um, within Canberra, of course, there is a gender agenda, which is where I work. Um, and we also do have a few really good resources online. Um, but I'd, I'd guess, so I'd say if you're, you've just found out you're intersex or wanting to learn more about who you are, your community, I'd really start ticking those, those kind of boxes. So looking at amazing YouTube videos, um, looking at intersex-led organizations um, and seeing the information and the, the, and the support that they're giving out. Nice. Thank you. I feel like that's going to be really, really helpful. I get, I get a lot of people messaging me saying like, oh, I just found out that I'm intersex. Um, and yeah, I feel like this is going to be very helpful for a lot of people. So amazing you're giving, you're giving such amazing answers and you're so <laughs> eloquent and just is flowing so great I'm loving it good I'm glad <laughs> um I I'm just going to ask you now like this is what I was speaking about uh the other day on my uh, on, on the radio talking about representation in the media uh, have you ever seen many things being portrayed in the media about intersex? And now that it's starting, I feel like, in my opinion, intersex is about to start having its moment. And I hopefully that we're going to be start seeing intersex characters in shows and intersex people in in the mainstream media and stuff. How do you think that they could be uh, more accurate and inclusive in, in this representation of intersex. Yeah, so I think it, it is really cool how we're seeing a lot more intersex representation. I think in the past, it hasn't always been done very, very well. And I think that's kind of what's led to a lot of misunderstanding um, and perpetuated stigma around our community um, because where we get most of our knowledge from as a society is representation and media um but recently I have been seeing a lot more um intersex representation in really positive lights actually just before I came on to um talk to you um I was in the in downstairs with my girlfriend and she was her current obsession is Chicago Med she was like oh my gosh 
Chicago Med has an intersex person um, as a patient on the show. And she was telling me that it was being done in such a sensitive and such a, a, a really supportive way. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Um, slightly offended that you didn't wait to watch the episode with me, <laughs> but <laughs> we can move on. Um, but yeah, so it's really, really cool that we're seeing so much more representation. Um, there are still um, issues and misunderstandings that do occur. And I think the best way to overcome those is to really talk and involve intersex people in the development of uh, whatever you're working on, whether that's um, TV shows or documentaries, movies or books. Um, there are some really, really great books out there, um, XOXY being just one of them um, that are actually written by intersex people and you can gain so much information from that. Um, but then also looking at the, the media that's taking intersex voices and uh, giving them the power to share their stories, not sharing the stories on their behalf. I think a really uh, exciting piece of um, a film that's coming out is Everybody um, and I'm, I can't wait to watch it yeah um, I've so... seen it oh you have <laughs> yeah yeah oh, I know no so way. I'm doing I'm doing some advertising for it um, they like for Focus Features reached out to me and they were like oh do you want to do some advertising on TikTok for it and they're like we'll have to send you the movie and I was like okay gosh that's so exciting and it's amazing and I was just feeling like I'm gonna cry but feeling happy and like oh wow yeah you're gonna love so it so exciting yeah okay well I can't wait because it's got River Gallo, Sean Cypher Walls and Alicia Rothwiggle and they are three absolutely like amazing intersex people all in the US um but just uh, all I've done is read the reviews and read like information about how it was written and all the rest, but seeing how the director and the producers really helped and used the medium of film to, to give them the path to share their stories uh, just seems really, really amazing. And I think that's how you get uh, impactful and accurate representation of intersex individuals. Um, and I think that will go so, so far in breaking down a lot of the stigma that we experience in our society, um, but also go so far in providing representation for intersex people. As I was saying, like, you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And for intersex people seeing, you know, intersex experiences up on the big screen, I think will be um such a special moment I'm um, changing for a lot of people yeah yeah a hundred percent yeah oh I'm so jealous you've seen it <laughs> <laughs> I know I feel so lucky honestly I I was just yeah oh yeah because I, I had only been told about the film like a couple weeks prior to to them reaching out and I had actually not heard of River Gallo like how I know and then I followed them and I was like oh my gosh this movie is gonna be amazing and then then I, I somehow manifested it into my life and then they were like you gotta watch this movie and then do some advertising for it and I was like okay I already know I'm gonna cry I know I'm gonna be yeah. feeling goosebumps so I'm gonna be feeling all the good things and yeah even just yeah I'm not gonna say much I'm not gonna say much you, you'll see it it's amazing don't ruin it for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's very very powerful and in just such an important important step forward for the intersex community mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah it's it's pretty pretty exciting I can't wait for you to see it and then we can talk about it amazing amazing we might have to do another podcast a little yes. movie review oh <laughs> uh, yes. that would be a fantastic idea yes absolutely <laughs> um so I guess starting to close everything in, um, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future of intersex visibility? Um, I mean, 
I guess something we haven't really touched upon, and I know you just said let's wrap things up, and this is oh, opening no, a whole like, I mean, can of worms. Yeah, let's open the can of worms. <laughs> like a, a big issue that intersex people have, or a uh, something really shocking um, that a lot of intersex people experience is the the medical intervention um, that happens often um, at very young ages. Um, they can be a medical intervention that's unnecessary, that's um, deferrable, and that's um, unconsensual, obviously, because um, when they are performed, they're performed at such a young age that the child just can't give consent. Unfortunately, these interventions um, are, are what happened when I was one, um, and they can lead to really, really negative um, and detrimental consequences. One of those being um, sterilization. So actually removing testes will mean that you can no longer have children. Um, and uh, some other issues can be loss of sensation, it can be um, urinary or urination issues, um, and a whole range of other things, um, let alone kind of the, the psychological damage that having surgeries performed at such a young age have on you, um, thinking that your body was so in inverted commas abnormal that doctors had to intervene and fix you um, is just so so damaging um, and actually a couple of years ago the UN and the United Nations came out and said that these medical interventions were acts of human violation um, and I think really goes against um, human rights and and definitely against bodily autonomy um, person-centered care all of these really important things um, within medical profession. So I guess a really big aspiration for the future um, is that these medical interventions don't happen anymore um, unless they're consented to by the child. Um, really excitingly, a couple of weeks ago, the ACT actually passed legislation um, to protect intersex children from these really harmful and deferrable medical interventions, um, meaning that now surgeons won't be able to, to change um, the bodies and kind of, in their eyes, fix what they think is wrong and fix a child into these very binary notions of what they think male and female bodies should look like. Um, and preventing these surgeries, I think, gives the opportunity for for intersex children to grow up in bodies that they're born into. Um, and yes, when they're older, they can make those decisions for themselves um, about whether they want the surgeries or not. Um, but I kind of see it as like, you wouldn't go ahead and give a baby a rhinoplasty, like a nose job, because their nose is born like they're born and their nose is too big and you wouldn't as a parent be like well let's you know make it look normal um instead you'd wait until the baby grows up and they can make a decision for themselves um and I guess that's exactly what we want for for the intersex community as well um yeah. And in the coming years, I really hope that the legislation that's passed in the ACT can, can be taken up by other states and territories around Australia. I think yeah. Victoria has done a lot of work, especially with Equality Australia, to, um, to consult with community and write a, a draft legislation um, and give an idea of what this legislation could look like um wow. but it's now that's awesome go victoria really awesome but it's now really up to the victorian government to take that information on and actually take steps to protect the the intersex community from these awful um abuses and violations of intersex rights and just human rights um and seeing that then go to Victoria and Tasmania and hopefully New, New South Wales, um, all of all of Australia, I think that's really my my big aspiration, um, and would be really awesome. 
Um, but legislation in itself is only the first step. Um, and really, it's what that legislation leads to that's really important. I think once we're protecting intersex kids from harm, then we can unpack and understand why we're protecting intersex kids and greater communities across Australia can understand what intersex is and can understand um, the shame and discrimination that intersex people have experienced in the past and can make sure that they are, are putting steps to, to protect intersex people from experiencing similar shame and stigma. Um, and then hopefully one day we'll be um, raising beautiful and proud intersex children who are going to school and um, learning about what intersex is in biology classrooms and in PDHP and going home and, you know, talking about like all of the things that kids talk about, but also being proud of, of being intersex. It, what can we do you know, the rest of the, the community and also the allies and the people who really care about us. Um, what can we do to help um, support this mission, getting this across the rest of the country? Like yeah, so a big issue, I think, or the pushback um, about this legislation is like, well, if we don't, in, you know, quotation marks, fix these kids, um, then they'll be born and be raised so differently and then they'll experience abuse and stigma. But really that's not the case. Research has shown that that's not the case. I mean, currently the, the rates of mental health issues um, that are purported because of uh, medical intervention are so high. Um, and these medical interventions do cause, I believe, a lot more harm than they do good. Um, so I think actually, changing the dialogue, changing the conversation, understanding, just even understanding what intersex is, the difference between sex and gender, um, and then sharing that to, you know, your siblings and your friends and your grandma and everyone. Um, everyone and their dog. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. will change kind of the per perception of what intersex is. Um, and then the whole of Australia can understand that intersex people don't need to be fixed because they're not abnormal. They are just natural variations in our human experiences. Um, so I think really educating yourself, but then talking about that and sharing that to others is really what individuals can do. Wow. This has been such a good first interview. I'm so I'm just so happy. Thank you so much for coming on. I feel so pumped up and uh, yeah, I'm ready for everyone to listen to this. Um, where can people find you if you just want to plug yourself? <laughs> so um, basically you can find me on Instagram. Uh, I've got an account called Let's Talk About Intersex. Um, and it's an account where I kind of share my personal experiences of being intersex um and also share some random facts and information about what it is to be intersex um so hopefully to to share and help educate um other people about you know our experiences because we need to know more um, so that's where you can find me um yeah nice okay well thank you so much for your time and for just being so beautiful yeah I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story you know it's not easy for everyone to be as open um and and really wear their story on their sleeve I guess so to speak and so very very powerful and super grateful that you are here with us and thank you so much thank you no it's been amazing um, as always, I'm so happy to talk about myself and so happy to talk about being intersex and um, sharing my story. So thank you for letting me share. Of course. All right. Thank you so much, Mimi. Amazing. Bye. Bye.